Zero Trust World 2024. Cybersecurity is everyone's business, but for IT professionals, it's critical. Over three days, you'll get the cybersecurity education that you need. We'll show you the latest threats and hacking techniques, and how to harden your environment and commonly weaponized applications like RMS and Office 365. Really informative. I, did, I actually just went to the Metasploit lab. They were showing us how to use like an SMB exploit, which is pretty cool. Hacking labs are amazing, and actually uh, seeing how you can do things that will fix the problem. Definitely recommend the event. I mean, the hacking labs are fantastic. Definitely learned a lot. Not only will you have an educational and enjoyable experience, you'll get actual insights to take back to your organization to better your security. Zero Trust World is your all access pass to the state of default denial. Register today to join us in Orlando this February for Zero Trust World 2024. Visit ThreatLocker.com to reserve your pass now. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon if you're coming in from across the pond. Uh, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes on human hacking, social engineering. That's the one. We're going to talk today about social engineering, what does it mean, and what are the risks, how can we protect against it, and what can we do with the weakest part of our environment, which is people, because people are always the weakest part of any security solution. Uh, so before we begin, Rob, any thoughts? How do we solve? Um, I'm actually, I'm just reminded. So we had a uh, person in the office last week who had a problem with their computer, and when they were they went over to infrastructure in a panic or to internal IT in a panic, going my computer's broken, and I said PEBCAC, and they had no idea what PEBCAC was. That problem exists so. between chair and computer. Oh, we call that layer eight issues. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I suppose relevant to social engineering. Problem exists often between chair and computer. So so what the problem with the user's computer was, if it was the same one, it's ThreatLocker has managed to breed a little bit too much paranoia. <laughs> so when the user messed up their keyboard, probably through spilling milk on it or something, mm -hmm. the keyboard started hammering keys out like over and over and over again because it was jammed. <laughs> They couldn't press it. It, it was even worse than that. It, it was, it won't turn on. Have you held the power button for 30 seconds? Yes, I've held the power button for 30 seconds. Are you sure you've held the power button for 30 seconds? Yes, I'm sure. Go over, hold the power button. Oh, this is a different one, it turns yeah, on. Well, one. Th th this one was the keyboard that had gone faulty that turned into a massive security incident because someone was typing on their computer. Oh, that's why I saw a picture of lots of people standing around. That's what that was. Yes, uh, and it's I was like, Go and unplug the external keyboard. And, oh, that's the problem. Is that, yes, yeah, sometimes there's not a hacker at the other end of it. It's just the yeah. keyboard is playing up. And they, they freaked out because their keyboard, let whatever, some keys had gone into a continuous press mode. And it, it turned into a major security incident with half of threat locker up surrounding the desk. And uh, I thought someone was going to come in with a, an AR-16 or something and start... <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get these guys, but that that was um what I want to know is how long it took them to diagnose this and did it did it need to involve you? No, I was just getting annoyed with lots of people not doing any work outside my office. So it, that's how it involved me because it definitely <laughs> didn't need to involve me. And was like this is a keyboard plug problem. Unplug the keyboard. Oh, that's it. So anyway, unfortunately, so that's what happens when you tell everyone the world's out to get them. They believe the world's out to get them. And as soon as their mouse flickers, they think someone's on their machine. Uh, but most of the time, it actually is someone on your machine. And quite often, there's something bad happening in your environment. And that is because users do things that they shouldn't do. I would say, I I'm not going to claim any stats because every single website is going to show something different. But most cybersecurity attacks at least involve a user at some point during the process. And what people don't understand is while a user may not have access to the keys to the kingdom, they often become an entry point into a network. So if somebody gets fished, someone gets there into somebody's Office 365 account, and now they're in the Office 365 account, they can now plant files in OneDrive. They can move around. They can send emails to other people from an internal source, which are more likely to be trusted. And before you know it, it becomes into a major cybersecurity incident. So even a user that has no access, that has no relevance, and that's 
doesn't appear to have a massive threat to the business, them getting their account compromised can be a big start to a cyber account. Because if I get an email from someone from ThreatLocker and it's not signed by ThreatLocker and it's not in inside our SPF or DK, DKIM, I'm, it's going to flag and it's going to warn it. But if someone gets into someone on the front desk account who has very little access to anything in Threat Locker, and then they email me, I'm more likely to trust them, email them back. Hey, I'm ordering groceries. What's the credit card number? Can we do this? Can we pay th this bill? And before you know it, it becomes a bigger incident. So I've got a piece of paper, very printed, very nicely printed out to talk about some of the common types of social engineering attacks. Um, just a reminder, we do have a Q&A section. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible, but please post your questions in the Q&A if you have any. Um, and uh, Bluetooth is a mouse. Yeah, so Bluetooth mouse and rucksack. Yeah, and it, well, the, the <laughs> Bluetooth mouse. And if you want, if you want to see a real a real problem with Bluetooth, look at check out our previous webinar on. No, YouTube. no, there's no reason anybody should look at that webinar, Danny. Everyone should look at that webinar no, no, where, no. where where we it, it successfully intercepted. Rob's, it wasn't a Bluetooth keyboard as well, Rob's Bluetooth headset and gained full control over his Mac, just to say Mac. Really secure Mac. Really secure Mac. And we gained full control over his Mac, including keyboard control. We got a reverse shell and we did all sorts of cool things, including XFIL is data. So if you want to see how an Apple headset can turn into an entry point from 200 feet away, check out our previous webinar, uh, Hardening Mac Devices, which probably should be renamed to Destroying Rob's Mac. Of course, Email phishing. So what is a phishing attack? Somebody sends an email, common old phishing is click on this link, update your Office 365 password, log into your Bank of America account, your account's been suspended. We've detected susp suspicious activity, please log in and change your password. All of these are traditional phishing. Someone clicks on it, their password gets stolen, someone now gets into their bank and or into their Office 365 account and the, their account is compromised. That is old school phishing and it's pretty scary just to explain though or one thing that people probably don't consider with this i mean if say somebody gets into your disney plus account or your peacock account or your whatever because i'm getting loads of emails about that these days the purpose of the exercise really is to try and get passwords because one of the big problems is that people reuse passwords across various sites so the fact is, if they get into your Disney Plus account and you use a password of Rob123, that's not my password for Van Disney Plus, by the way, um, the, there's a reasonably strong likelihood that you're also using those same credentials, <laughs> those same <laughs> credentials on another website, which is probably going to be more valuable to them. So it is, it, it doesn't matter how important the site is to you, whether or not they can actually use it. It is, it is more just about getting people's credentials. And that that kind of causes another problem because while we tell users they're not allowed to reuse passwords, even the best trained users in the world are going to reuse their password. I, I would say 20, 30% of the employees in a company are probably using the same password for their threat locker login or their, their system login. I hope not as a Disney plus login. Oh uh, God, I hope not. Yeah. So, but the, people are people. It doesn't matter what you say. Physical restrictions is what stops people doing things. So, for example, when you reset your password in ThreatLocker, uh, in our domain, in our Office 365, it says you can't use a previous password. That's a physical restriction. Does someone put an extra exclamation mark at the end or an extra one on the end? Quite possibly. But physical restrictions obviously stop people doing that. But they do do it. And once they get a password, they can get in around. So there's a, there's a method called SLAM, identify phishing with SLAM. Um, so how do we identify a phishing email? Now, this is, I think some of this is not perfect, by the way. Who's the sender? Who sent the email? Now, spoofing the emails, it's actually pretty easy, but with, sorry, SPF, it gets a little bit harder. Um, but who did send the email is the first thing you should be questioning. And is that email, is that person expected to send me an email? Was it sent from outside of your organization? So putting a banner saying this email comes from the outside of your organization, really, really useful thing because it helps identify this is not internal. Um, and of course, when they're sending, who, who are they impersonating someone? I remember I was doing training at my kid's school. Uh, so my kids go to uh, a local school here or did go to a local school here. Now they're in a different school because they've graduated to high school now. Um, and we used to do cybersecurity training for them every year. 
The day before cybersecurity training, I sent an email to everyone asking them for their passwords from Danny45687 at Gmail. We were looking after their IT. This is a long time ago. And about a third of the teachers in the school sent me their login passwords. And the day afterwards, we went through training and said that, that was really gone. And one of them even commented how cool it was that I used Gmail. <laughs> so even though they recognize us from a different address, is email address the person's email address? Now, a year later, I got a little bit smarter. And the day before training, I registered a similar domain, but I switched the L out to a capital I. Little trick, in Outlook, in Office, in most fonts, you cannot tell the difference between a capital I and an L. So if you go and register a domain, say threatoinker.com, I instead of L, which we've already got. So anyone who's going on for me. <laughs> yeah, just in case I need to get ideas. Yeah, threatoinker.com. And you send an email and you set up SPF and you set up DKM and you send it from threatoinker.com with a capital I. The recipient cannot see the difference. And this is really important because when someone's impersonating, they don't have to spoof your email address. They can spoof something very, very close. So you should be paying a lot of attention. And if you tip of the day, if you do have an L in your domain name, go off and register it with an I. If you've got two L's, it gets a lot more complicated because you've got to register multiple because someone else can register it and it's very hard to detect that spoof. But sender, that's the first I, part. I, listen, I'm not going to lie. I kind of want to rob at threatoinker.com. <laughs> you're not having a lot of that. so uh, just so you can send people messages from yeah. that <laughs> um just while we're um, on the subject um eric has asked a question which is an interesting one which is are password manager apps a good way to deal with reusing passwords my users worry about placing their passwords into something they think could be hacked so uh to the second part of that yes password managers can be hacked and yes they can be compromised is it a good way to reuse passwords? This is my thought on it. And this is the threat locker policy. Um, so when using a password map, first of all, there are certain passwords that need to be in here and should not be in your password manager. So in threat locker, our threat locker portal passwords, our email passwords and our, our office 365 and our domain password, domain, ad, domain if you're a domain, if you log into the domain, um, admin passwords have to be in your head. They cannot go into a password manager because the risk of those being compromised is too bad if that password manager gets compromised. The password managers in general are a good way of avoiding using passwords. And I personally use a password manager. If you want to increase security on password managers, one of the things you can do is salt them. So what that means is have a five-digit password that you append to the end of every password and set when you generate a new password in your password manager, generate it, but then add five characters using your keyboard. So if someone gets those five characters, <clears throat> they still can't get into your account, but if they get your password, they still can't get into your account. So that's a good way of doing with it. My general opinion is, I'm interested to hear your, yours, Rob, is it's okay, but there's certain accounts you want to think about not putting in there. And domain admin accounts, definitely don't want them in there. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, again, it's it's a question of which password manager as well, to some extent. I mean, there has been fairly well publicized password manager breaches over the last year without naming any names. I'm sure everybody knows who was involved. Um, Five but, times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I used to use said uh, well-known password manager. Um, I don't anymore, as you can um, imagine. Um, as you said, there's certain things that shouldn't be there. There are certain things that should be just in your head. Um, the, I mean, the other problem with them is often they stay logged in on your computer. Mm -hmm. So if you are an IT director and you have a password manager on your PC and someone gains access to your PC because you have a remote access tool on there and there's a vulnerability in it, they now got onto your machine. They can get into your software deployment tools. They can get into your domain. This is why those are a big no-nos and they can gain access because quite often the browser keeps the password manager saved in, signed in. Could I, could I just say on a Mac using iCloud Keychain, you do have to authenticate with biometrics. So either, well, you can use a password obviously, but fingerprint or face. No, I to get into the password manager. Let's not get into this Mac conversation again. I, I know, I know, but look, I have to get back a little so, bit. So tip about Mac users on password <laughs> managers. When you're logging into things on your computer, 
they're automatically synced to your phone. And if someone takes your phone and points it at your face, they can see. My, all my daughter tried to do that the other day. And what did I do? Close my eyes. She couldn't okay. unlock it. I, I'm not oh, sure attention. that's your, your attention. attention. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure. Interestingly enough, and th this is actually quite relevant to this, if you do use iCloud Keychain, um, iOS 17.3, I think, is coming out next week, and it's got a feature called Stolen Device Protection, which is actually, it has become apparent, is really important, because something that's happening is that people are I mean, shoulder surfing, getting people's pin codes and basically stealing their phones. And once you've got a pin code to somebody's iPhone, it's pretty much the keys to the kingdom. Including um, the iCloud key Keychain. Including, well, everything, basically, yes. So they've introduced this um, stolen device protection, which means that you can't, I think it's you can't change Office 3, oh, sorry, you can't change iCloud passwords unless they're in specific locations and also like there's a one hour waiting period or something. I, I don't know the details, but basically have a look at that when iOS 17.3 comes out because again, there's so much information on people's phones these, these days, including passwords that can be accessed with just a pin code. And iCloud is an example of a password manager I don't like because it does allow you to access with your pin code on your phone. Okay, <laughs> so links, are the links in the email? If there's links in the email, the, the probability of the link being bad increases. So checking the source, the destination of the link, being really, really careful about- Hover where, over. Hover over. One of the things I do not like about the iPhone is <laughs> yeah. it, you got I, done by you got done by fishing training on this, didn't you? No, no, I didn't get done by fishing training right, on this. Okay. But I, but because I, the problem I have is I'm scared to actually click on the UPS links when they're legitimate because on the iPhone you can't hover over the link. And of course, we get sent to school. I, I didn't get done because I'm smart enough not to. But a lot of people get sent to school because they clicked on that fake UPS link because they were trying to click on it to see where it went to on the phone. And it actually and, opens it in preview. And, and it, it opens it in preview. And then someone's going to back to uh, training camp. Uh, so I did not get done it, but it's it means I actually don't check anything that I can't. Not because I think I'm gonna get fished, because frankly, if I clicked on the link, it would take me to all the page and it said, enter your credentials, I'm just closing the page. Um, however, I don't want to have to go to onto the, the wall of shame. Uh, so um, is there an attachment in the email? Uh, more and more phishing has attachments in it because uh, it's harder to scan within attachments. If you put images in attachments, I, I used to run an email security company. So more and more phishings are giving instructions in attachments. And the other way of identifying phishing is, now these ones are becoming less and less relevant. We're going to talk about that. Say that. Yeah. Grammar errors. You'd be surprised as of a year ago, two years ago, maybe, most phishing emails actually had grammar errors in them. So identifying grammar's errors is a really easy way to say is a I see if this is a phishing email. However, AI, the attacker's friend and no friend to defenders because I'm yet to find a valid use case where AI is defending. So, but attackers can use AI to generate really, really well-written emails that do not have spelling mistakes. If, you, if you get a scam email or a spam email that <laughs> has bad grammar today, they're really not trying. Yeah, I mean, you should almost contact them and say, look, have, have you heard of ChatGPT? Because you really should use ChatGPT. There's no reason today for there be, to be grammatical errors in um, in scam emails. So that it's not really a way to identify them anymore. Urgency. Anything that says this is going to be done right now is really bad and needing something important like money or logins. Jason Crafton, Mackhead here. Good man, Jason. Scott mentioned you could also do a homo oh my god homoglyph. I have no idea what that is. Attack and use an alternative alternative language characters like Russian or Greek. Oh, I think this is response to L. Um, this is it, no, it's it's sorry, it's to do with passwords. Oh, specifically, so basically use things like Russian or Greek letters as part of your password. Um, fun stuff, nearly imperceptible to the end user. He gives us a link which I'm not going to click on. Um, somebody else mentioned PAM solutions are very important for admin password management as they rotate admin passwords every time they're checked out and in. Uh, so um, maybe I, I would argue a better solution would be to not have admin passwords at all. As much but as but the, on that, if you do have admin passwords on your machines, of course, there's two things. Um, one is local admin passwords 
Uh, Threat Locker can rotate them. If you've got Threat Locker Protect, you can add Configuration Manager free of charge. We can rotate the admin pa- local admin passwords every day or every 14 days, whatever you set on there, and you can access them from the portal. So rather than having to have give a user a password or user password, it's always going to be changed. The other thing that's really useful is with Threat Locker Elevation, you don't need to enter an admin password ever. You can put the machine in a maintenance mode, which allows the user to run programs as an admin, which means your keyboard if intercepted, it's not going to be able to intercept your password. So a couple of points on that. Uh, Rick mentioned, and I, I don't know what this is. Rick mentioned it's probably worth mentioning the RLO, right to left override trick. Insane how easy it is to trick people with that. Threat Locker protects against this, thank God. I have no idea what an RLO trick is. Passwords, uh, passkeys are the future. Um, passkeys are pretty cool. I'm seeing more and more services do now support passkeys. Yes, I, I'm very, very much concerned about this. <laughs> and it, <laughs> I am really, really concerned about this because it, it, I think Apple adding extra features helps. But how easy it is to get into the iPhone or any phone, not just Apple. I'm not beating up on Apple. Uh, but how easy it is and how much power we hold in our hand with passwordless. I really, yes, I think they're the future. But I really like the idea of something you know that you should always have to, e- something you have and something you know is two factors. You should always have to enter something you know. Let's talk about vishing, v phishing, uh, because this is becoming a bit of an issue with people using fake voice ID to get information from someone. And Rob very, very quickly created it in what, 20 seconds? Uh, uh, give it 30 seconds. 30 seconds created an AI me, an AI you. Do you want to play that, Rob? Yeah, no worries. Hey, Danny, this is Rob, the Threat Locker Cyber Hero. I need you to give me your password, the last four digits of your credit card number, and your full social security number. Don't worry, you can trust me. Hey, Danny, this Oops. is Rob, the Threat Locker. I just started again. I just wanted to point out, by the way, it does pronounce Threat Locker correctly. As the weirdness in the pronunciation, I think it's fair to say it does have a bit of an Irish accent. So did it clone you? Did you say I'm Irish when you put that no, in? Absolutely not. I read about 10, 15 lines of text and it learned me. It, it, I mean, it's not perfect. Well, I think on a it's cell pretty phone, damn good. Yes. A, I'm apparently phone, I'm able to take a deep breath before I see before I say now. So mm-hmm. But um, because it also did include that in the um recording, but it it's scarily scarily good. So I wonder how it says scarily. <laughs> oh God, I could I could try, but later we um, uh, listen. You're gonna find out all about this when I completely do you. I'm going to have an AI Danny ready for the rest of the next webinar. If you can get do demos for me as well, it'd be great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I did mention this part of the training text that this particular website used was they did mention that a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company uh, used this particular service to read their financials. I think what the concern about voice or vishing, I could probably call, even though all of our cybersecurity policies say no, but I reckon if I called 20 people in Threat Locker, and asked for their password. I would say three would probably give it to me. And this is everyone who goes through policies and pretty strict training. I'd say more than that. I mean, full disclosure, what I'm planning to do with your voice is I want to do a AI Danny soundboard. Have you ever seen seen the soundboards where you can basically pick different phrases? So it's not just like a straight on recording. I can say, have a button, which is, hi, this is Danny. And then another button which says, give me your password, please. That that kind of thing. So I'm going to do an AI Danny soundboard and have some fun with it. But I reckon more than three out of 20 would. I reckon if you did Nick in support, you'd have chat, chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every time he gets to about 25 seconds. Yeah. But uh, no, I think three is a very conservative uh, or optimistic number. I think a good third of people would probably give you their password if they truly believed it was you. A lot of cyber attacks happen like this. And I believe, although no guarantee confirmation on this, the MGM was uh, voice phishing 
to a level one support guide to turn off dual factor authentication or to a reset something on behalf of someone higher level. And that is a big concern because users do not expect voices to be scammed. So big problem there. Now, what can we do about dual factor authentication? What is the one control that we can put in place that deals with the fact that people are going to make mistakes and give away their passwords? And it's going to happen. It doesn't matter how hard you try and how much you train your users. And you absolutely should train your users not to click on links, to check things, not to put their passwords in sites they don't know, not to put their password into someone else's computer, because that's another problem. Um, actually, here's a perfect example. At Zero Trust World, two years ago, we had G2 on site doing reviews on behalf of FatLocker. And G2 is a review site, and they ask people to write a review. Do you use FatLocker? Can you write a review? Now, they validate that you actually use ThreatLocker. And about halfway through the conference, I found out they were asking people to log into their ThreatLocker account to validate that they use ThreatLocker from their computer. Now, this was not set up by us. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was so mad that they were doing it because we invited them and they, they asked people to enter credentials. But we were at a cybersecurity conference at Zero Trust World. And IT cybersecurity professionals were logging into their threat locker account from somebody else's computer. Else's computer. And it's going to happen. So what control can we put in place? What, what, what can we do assuming that it's going to happen? Well, there's a dual factor, multi-factor. Something you have, something you know. If you can do both of those things, that is the most important control you can put in place to prevent the theft, not prevent the theft of credentials, but prevent the use of theft of credentials. Because we have no control over the user. We have no control over our email. And yes, we should have email detection to look for known phishing scams. We should have training for our users, but dual factor is the most important thing you can put in place. Just to mention as well, Danny, not all dual factors are the same. Dual factor by SMS, I'm not going to say it's as good as useless, but it's not far off as good as useless. Would that be a fair assessment? I'd, I'd probably give it a little bit of credit, but it it, it stops the lower, less sophisticated. The least, it's, it's the least effective uh, multi-factor, shall we say. Least recommended yes. multi-factor. Well, I, I, I would go to the, a QR code on your computer where your password saved in your browser. You, you know, your, the, your, your OTC plugin for Chrome, I would say that's pretty there, close. Mm, okay, <laughs> so, fair, fair. Separate device, something you have, something you know. That, Daniel is making the point that biometrics is the future. Fingerprints, Windows Hello, et cetera. Apple is all in with Face ID replacing finger. Fingerprints, what an awesome word. Is fingerprints a, wor prings a word? I presume he meant fingerprints, but fingerprints are pretty cool as well. But yeah, biometrics is the future, according to, da to Daniel. Okay, so the, I would love biometrics to be the future because I think it's the best way. The question is, how do we guarantee the data being sent to the server is the data from the device? On a phone, very easy because we're locally authenticating onto a device. So Apple can say, this is my camera. I'm validating the data. However, if we're talking about a web server or a cloud-based solution, I don't know of a way because the local device is the only thing that can actually validate it. Otherwise, someone could copy, intercept that, send it to the web server. So I, I think it, for local devices, we're going to see, yes, Face ID, Windows Hello, biometrics. But for remote servers, it still comes back down to the same problem. And now, you, you could go as far as saying, well, we trust the local device because uh, and they're putting uh, certs on the local device to validate the local device, and the local device is authenticating them. But that's about as far as we get we, because we cannot validate face ID over the internet. I have to say, I'm also deeply suspicious, deeply suspicious of Windows Hello, given that when you register face ID on a phone, it uses LiDAR, it uses all sorts of things to build the shape of your face. And it takes a bit of time and you have to do all this stuff and everything else. Setting Windows Hello, it literally just looks at your camera for 10 seconds and goes, Windows Hello is set up. Now, I have no evidence other than my feelings to back this up. 
but I can't help but feel if I registered Windows Hello with a picture of me like this and then tried to log into a machine with a picture of me like this, that it would work. No, I don't think it works for the picture. I don't, I don't think it works. It's, it's yeah. a, it's However, a identical to Windows are a problem. So, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's a, it's a method. I think it's really for local devices. And maybe there's going to be a way of actually guaranteeing and passing it through um, in the future. And so we'll look at a common type of it. Spear phishing. This one's very common. This is how probably most successful phishing campaigns happen is um, someone actually sends something more targeted. So they actually go out and they say, I know, and this often happens post ransomware attack. Cause think about this. Someone gets a ransomware attack. They take all your data, they ex or they put malware on your machine. They collect your data, they collect all the invoices of the people you do business with. It doesn't even need to be ransomware. And then they email you from a sim similar domain from let's just say Staples office supply saying, Hey, your $4,900 invoice that was due, um, we've updated our payment details. At this point, you feel comfortable because you know there's a $4,900 interview invoice. You know you dealt done, have done business with them and you update the account details and pay them. And that is becoming very, very problematic. Of course, the bigger numbers are in the real estate industry where the, the amount, the emails are intercepted. Someone gains access to one of the emails or they send the email saying this is the bank details, but finance industry. But there's also a lot of small stuff. Hey, can you pay? I've updated my $3,000 invoice. Can you pay this? And that is actually really hard to deal with. And I, and I remember when we were doing a fundraising campaign, uh, sorry, fundraising in Threat Locker, we were getting one of our first big checks and it was in the millions. So it was a, a, as enough um, money. And the company we we're raising from had checks in to make sure that the balance is, they're not just emailing, doing it from email. So what they did is they emailed me and said, can I get your phone number so I can verbally authenticate the bank details? Sounds like a smart thing to do. However, here's the challenge. The person then called me and it was my phone number. And she said, can you, what's your bank number? What's your routing number? And I said to her, do you know there's a fundamental flaw with the way you just validated me? She said, what? I said, one is you've never spoke to me. You don't know the sound of my voice. Two is the phone number you got was from an email. If either of our email had been compromised, if, you, if just the, verified with the scammer. you just verified with the scammer the account number so th these things happen quite a lot and it's i think training users on this and better banking technology is the solution to this where we can validate names and validate banking tech numbers on the bank accounts not just outside of that but this it's becoming a big problem and a lot of companies are losing money uh, and quite often it happens after a malware attack where someone ran malware extracted your files and now they can directly spear fish you because they know the data and in a lot of cases danny i mean we we spoke for for quite some time about the you know somebody getting into a machine and literally just grabbing a accounts database you know what i mean they don't need to destroy anything they don't need to do anything other than grab that database from the accounts package because they can then use that data for targeted spear phishing as you said um, so it is something to be aware of. Uh, by the way, sorry, Rick elaborated on the RLO. So Google RLO, very cool trick, very dangerous because you're easily fooled by it. You guys should definitely know about this. Sorry, hands up. The attacker uses the RLO character, which apparently is U plus 202E, to alter the appearance of the file name. For example, let's consider a malicious executable file with the name photo1234gpg.exe. By inserting the RLO character before the .exe extension, the attacker can change the displayed name to photo1234exe.gpj. So basically, effectively renames executables by the looks of it um, to not executables, which is pretty cool. Um, but as he said, Threat Locker protects against it because we block more well, like default. So uh, the, um, although that's a pretty cool trick. Uh, so um, quishing, QR code phishing. Uh, see more and more QR codes. People are used to scanning QR codes and they, they, they scan the QR code and they say, oh, I'm, I'm downloading a program. I'm signing up for a service. I'm, I'm at a gym and I want to sign a up. Bill. Pay, it's Give more them. and more common with paying bills. And I, had, I had breakfast in Orlando airport the other day and the only way to pay them was to scan a QR code that was stuck to the table. Yes, that sounds concerning. Stick a sticker on and send it to someone else. Angular phishing, someone impersonating social media accounts. I would say three times an hour, 
So AppLocker's social media account gets an, a link sent to its chat saying that we are Facebook and your account suspended for violation of terms. Three times an hour, someone in someone claiming to be Facebook or another person does that. So that's really, really concerning. But then also getting your credentials allows them to go after everyone with your real account saying, hey, I'm from ThreatLocker or I'm from this person. So that's a big problem. This one, a big problem, pop-ups. Pop-ups embedded into ads on web pages. And actually, we got an email a few weeks ago from a customer who got safe on this because they got a pop-up saying your computer has a virus in a web page. The person dialed the 1-800 number, got a very nice man from Microsoft who sent them go to or log me and rescue or something, downloaded that. And of course, it got blocked because it was untrusted software. And that is becoming very, very common. I would say our cyber heroes receive requests for things like log me in, the rescue and um, team viewer on a daily basis from scammers, uh, from people who are being tricked by scammers thinking that it's Microsoft and I've got a virus on my machine. Somebody had that yesterday asked me about it. I've had staff who said I have a virus on my computer and it's just a pop-up from um, the likes of Edge or, or Chrome. And it, the, Someone's someone scared enough to call the number to remove it, that causes a big problem. Click on the link in the notification because it's always like the one we saw yesterday was click on the link in it was to turn on Windows Defender or pretending to turn on Windows Defender. Top tip. Shoulder, Top shoulder tip. surfing. You, you already mentioned this. Someone looking over your folder, it's very easy to see your pin. It's very easy to get someone's pin. Um, Face ID is good for that reason uh, if you can use it. But the iPhone still asks for the pin a lot. If you looked at it wrong too many times, it asks for your pin. It's very easy to steal someone's pin. And then once you have someone's pin, you can see it. Shoulder surfing is a big issue. Little tip on that. I've got one on my phone. Um, it's not gonna, it's not perfect because someone's directly behind you, but you can get screen privacy filters for your phone. Really cool, cost 20 bucks. It means if you're standing here, the screen is black. So on my phone here, my screen looks good, slightly tilt it, and it goes black. So it's harder for people to see. Gordon, uh, well, he said uh, Threadlocker's execution control should prevent malware, shouldn't it? That's a big yes. Uh, Dave Mason mentioned QR codes are evil. Absolutely. Watch it in action. Go on YouTube, search for this insane virus trick would have fooled me. Watch out. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, not going to click on that link, but that's fine. Uh, Daniel mentioned a lot of banks around here use RSA tokens, which works, but it's amazing how many users save their login sites, including bank sites. Drives me crazy. Users do not want to do the work to type login so many times. For a while, we were pushed, we were pushed password managers. Now all of them are getting compromised. Well, I don't think all of them are getting compromised, but it's a, it's certainly a concern. Yeah, password managers is a concern. Uh, like I said, if you have two parts to it, one part in the password manager, one part in your head, it helps. And don't put really important passwords in them. Uh, tailgating, another phishing, it, it happens a lot. Um, we constantly do testing here in our building uh, to, to make sure that people aren't pretending they work here. So we'll, we'll send someone down on the floor. They won't have a badge on and everyone they walk past, everyone they engage is what makes eye contact with them. It gets clocked. And then they, they say, why didn't you challenge this person who didn't have a badge on them uh, in the building? So tailgating is a problem, but also badges. We actually made a change in threat locker. So the bottom of our badges uh, the color on them changes every 90 days. So everyone gets a new badge every 90 days. So if someone leaves or someone loses their badge, it becomes not working after 90 days. Uh, but tailgating is a big problem. Uh, and physical security is still important in the virtual world, especially if you're in a hospital or a car dealership. It's how a lot of um, attacks actually happen. Escalation of social media. We talked a little bit about this, but maybe some examples. You got any examples, Rob, you want to share? Share? Social media specifically, not really. I've actually, I've, I've. So, social engineering, sorry. Oh, social engineering, sorry. Um, I've, as I said, that that one, which is fresh in my mind, is the one from yesterday, which was the pop up, um, suggesting somebody had a virus. Um, it's so simple. It's so easy to do. You know what I mean? It's literally a bit of code in a in a website, and it's. <laughs> In fairness, it's very convincing. I mean, people don't really consider that to be social engineering, but it is. It's it's manipulating people to do things that are against their best, best interests. So that's, as I said. Here's an example of how how things escalate. And I, I used to do a lot of 
ethical hacking and testing like this with permission, I get onto a user's computer. So you trick a user, you give them a pop-up, you send them social, something on social media. Uh, if, if you want to get someone's attention, politics, easy as well. Anyone who's politically strong-minded, uh, it's very, very easy to get them to do things so they can see something that they want to see. And it doesn't matter how they think, whether they're left, right, opinion on whatever, you you show them something about the other side that's that's going to really cause problem. You say, oh, we've got this guy. Biden was caught doing this. Trump was caught doing this. It's very, very easy to get people to click on things. Uh, but user clicks on something, downloads something, tries to open this file, and you give them enough information. And the trick is to make them work for it. Because what happens is, if they've just filled in this massive form, and this is a marketing technique companies use as well. Hey, we can give you a free scale of uh, uh, your health. And they'll ask you to put in 20 questions and then you get to the end of the 20 questions and then they'll say, oh, you have to buy our app. And you've already gone down that route so people buy the app. But the same applies with phishing. You give them lots of questions, you give them lots of data, they download a piece of malware, you gain access to their machine. Well, that's their machine, it doesn't help you. The next trick is escalation. How does this become further? Well, I can put a key logger on the machine. I can wait for the IT guy to come and log in. I can break their machine. The IT guy logs in. Then we have the IT guy's password. Now I can move really, really quickly around the network, especially if he logs in with his domain admin uh, password. I can change files on network shares from Excel files to executables with um, Excel icons on them. Of course, Windows hides file extensions very conveniently. So when they open it, it opens the original file, and now we have a reverse shell on somebody else's computer. Suddenly, you've got access to more data. So one user's password, one access to OneDrive. You drop something in a Teams folder on OneDrive. It syncs to everyone's machine, and you wait for them to open it. These are things that allow you to escalate and move very, very quick in the environment. Um, one question. So Dave Mason has asked, what about authenticator apps? Um, mostly authenticator apps are good. One thing I have noticed, and again, yeah, Apple fanboy here, but um, there is a proliferation of, um, I'm not going to call them fake uh, authenticator apps, but certainly authenticator apps that pretend to be other authenticator apps, if I could put it that way. So we had um, some of the staff in Amir were trying to set up whatever it was at the time. And they were told to go in and download Microsoft Authenticator. So they went into the App Store, obviously typed in Authenticator and got a bunch of stuff that was very much not Microsoft Authenticator, but kind of looked like it. So similar icons, maybe different color, that kind of thing. So Authenticator apps are good, but again, just be careful of which Authenticator apps you're using. Um, Eric has asked a very practical question, which is we talked a lot about things not to do. What should we be doing? which I think they call technically a segue, Danny. Okay, so let's, uh, let's think about this. Dual factor authentication. Accept that users are going to give away their passwords. Train your users, accept that it's not going to be perfect, <laughs> and that, that's it, and implement other controls. Assume that your user is going to download a piece of malware, block untrusted software. Assume that someone's going to gain access to a PowerShell. Ring fence parachute, so it can't do anything. General security is what stops these attackers in their track. Users are going to be tricked all the time. Step one, train them. Step, I th I'm changing the order now. Step two, put dual factor authentication for the passwords and put controls like whitelisting, ring fencing on your endpoint. So when they do get tricked, the amount of damage is limited and they can't move further on. Uh, also, back that up with monitoring. You know, it's very, very simple. Get, if you get alerts, limit things. Um, one of the features in um, Office 365 is conditional access. Uh, we're about to make a huge enhancement to that as well, where you can actually update Office 365. So you, because what you can do in Office 365, you can say only these IP addresses can access my Office 365 tenant. That's really, really useful. So if someone does get in, they can't get into Office 365. <clears throat> But we're going to extend that so we can actually dynamically update those IP addresses based on the IP address of your phone or your computer at any point in time so you're not leaving it open to the world. But those are the kind of things you can do to limit the damage uh, of user behavior. General cybersecurity posture across the board is what's going to help you when this happens. Uh, and having checks and balancing, have it, having two people check something like big payments. You know, and we do it too. We make payments to vendors. But we have a policy, if it's over a certain amount, then 
someone has to call the number on their website. If it's a smaller amount, we're, we're saying that the cost of doing business is sometimes someone intercepts the sender's email because hopefully ours is secure and they change the bank details. But we'll, we'll take checks, we'll check invoices, we'll check purchase order IDs, but over a certain amount, make sure there's checks and balances in place. Rubber duckies, we didn't actually mention that. Of course, there's a, web, a webinar on YouTube if you missed the rubber ducky one. We're also going to cover them in Zero Trust World. Still a big issue, baiting users. If you put a USB drive in a parking lot, say in payroll, bonuses, you'll be surprised how many people will actually pick that up and put it into their computer. Rubber ducky, users will click on things when they can. Uh, users will open things, click on things if they're curious, if they're interested, because you've got to understand a large percentage of people that work for your company don't care about your company. It doesn't matter how hard you try, how much you think everyone does. There's a large percentage that don't care about the risk. They just care about their gossip or their data or their things. Memory cards. Leave memory cards. Oh, someone's pictures. Let me look at these. Someone's going to be curious and click on them. Um, Sean has asked, thoughts on passwordless authentication, FIDO2 authentication? Passwordless authentication, it, it comes back down to... I think all authentications would be something you know and something you have. And I think, and in fairness, um, I suppose that's what some of the authenticator apps are doing is there's when they're building it in with face ID or they're building it in with a password on the authenticator app. So they're like with Office 365, the authenticator, they give you a note push to your phone, but you then have to use either face ID or you have to put your Office 365 password in to to actually get it to give you the push in the first place. But I think something you have and something you know is better. Pa passwordless authentication helps and it helps stopping people put their data in. Oh, another trick for Office 365, actually, we covered this at Zero Trust World and we'll do a much more detailed dive at Zero Trust World. Put your company branding on your Office 365 login page. And the reason I say this is, it look, it's not going to stop targeted attacks against your company. But if users are used to seeing your company logo on the login page, and then they get a fake Office 365 one, they're less likely to do it. It doesn't cost you anything. Upload your logo, put it on there. It helps. It means if a user normally sees the Oka logo in their login and suddenly it comes up with the Office logo, they say, that's not my login page. Absolutely. And it, look, if it reduces it by 10%, it costs nothing. It's so easy to do as well. It's such an easy step and it really does make a difference because I, I know if I was prompted with a blog on page for Office 365 that didn't have our logo on it, I'd know something was wrong. We have two passes for Zero Trust World. So Zero Trust World, for those who join late, is a conference that we operate on February 26th to 28th here in Orlando, Florida. February is the best and the only time to visit Orlando, Florida. It's a comfortable 70-something degrees. Normally it's not the only time. It, is, it may be the best. It's not the only time. It's the only guaranteed time. Uh, to the, the most seven, eight, nine months of the year, Florida's lovely. It's just you don't know which seven, eight, nine months of the year. Um, the uh, But it, it's really nice weather, really great event. So what we do, three days, cybersecurity. It starts off thinking about this from a hacker side. We have hands-on labs. We're not really about, here's a bunch of slides, but you go in, you get on laptops, you learn how to use rubber duckies, flipper zeros, uh, Metasploit, all sorts of cool labs and training sessions on how to harden your environment and how to think like a hacker. Uh, we also do Threat Locker Cyber Hero training. So we will teach you on our product top to bottom. What's cool about that is if you actually pass your Cyber Hero test at Zero Trust World, heads up, you cannot pass it unless you study. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how long you've been using the product. You will not pass the Cyber Heroes test unless you study. study. So do university before you come. You can do the boot camps on site as well but recommend university first. But if you do pass your threat locker test on site, you get a full refund of your Zero Trust World ticket. Uh, so that's pretty cool as well. Uh, we have some cool speakers. So we have Mark Rober. Uh, he's um, the glitter bomb guy, NASA engineer. Uh, actually took down an entire fishing ring by scamming the scammer, if you like. Uh, so great guy. Um, he's coming up to speak as well. So it's a really great three, three days, of course. If you haven't already bought tickets, I think these coupon codes are going to expire soon. So uh, there's a coupon code for $200 off. That's, uh, so it ends up being $295. Uh, click on this. Uh, book your tickets for Zero Trust World. It really is a good three days, and it really is very, very educational. Uh, we are going to successfully fly a pineapple in on the drone and take control of Wi-Fi for the first time. <laughs>
Uh, that is the plan. Um, and we're going to try and rehearse that next week live or in two weeks live on our next webinar. Very much looking forward to that, Danny. If you haven't done a demo of Threat Locker or you'd like to schedule a demo for some of our newer products, I think Spencer's uh, going to dump the link in as well. Please book a demo for Threat Locker in the link. We have done some major upgrades to Threat Locker Ops this week. It really is cool. Uh, and it's the last chance to actually get it at last year's pricing. So early bird pricing. So if you want to find a demo of Threat Locker Ops, just book a regular demo and say, hey, I want to look at Ops. There's some really cool stuff coming out. But if you're not looking at Ops, everything else, network control, allow listing, ring fencing, all of these are really important controls to harden your environment. So click on that link and, and book that demo. Well, sorry, I was going to say so much for our quick half an hour webinar. It's been almost an hour and I have yes. to go to plane. So no, well, thank you for joining. Enjoy your flight back. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.